There is an animal called the beaver, whose testicles are very good as medicine. So the physiologist says, when he notices he is being pursued by the hunter, he removes his own testicles with a bite and casts them before the sportsman, and thus escapes by flight. What is more, if he should again happen to be chased by a second hunter, he lifts himself up and shows his members to him, and the latter, when he perceives his testicles to be missing, leaves the beaver alone. Hence, every man who inclines toward the commandment of God and who wants to live chastely must cut off from himself all vices, all motions of lewdness, and must cast them from him in the devil's face. Thereupon the devil, seeing him to have nothing of his own about him, goes away from him confused. That man truly lives in God. It is not captured by the devil who says, I shall preserve and attain these things. The creature is called Beaver, Castor, because of the castration. They are called monkeys, simia in the Latin language, because people notice a great similitude to human reason in them. Wise in lore and of the elements, these creatures grow merry at the time of the new moon. At half and full moon, they are depressed. Such is the nature of a monkey that, when she gives birth to twins, she esteems for one of them highly, but scorns the other. Hence, if it ever happens that she gets chased by a sportsman, she clasps the one she likes in her arms in front of her, and carries the one she detests with her arms round her neck. For this very reason, when she is exhausted by running on her hind legs, she has to throw away the one she loves, and carries the one she hates. A monkey has no tail, coda. The devil resembles these beasts, for he has a head, but no scripture, a codex. Admitting that the whole of a monkey is disgraceful, yet their bottoms really are excessively disgraceful and horrible. In the same way, the devil had a sound foundation when he was among the angels of heaven, but he was hypocritical and cunning inside himself, and so he lost his coda, codex, as a sign that all of him would perish in the end. As the apostle says, whom the Lord Jesus Christ will kill with the breath of his mouth. Simia is a Greek word meaning with squashed nostrils. Hence, we call monkeys this, because they have turned up noses and a hideous countenance with wrinkles lewdly puffed like bellows. It is also said to be a characteristic of goats to have a turned up nose. Sarcopithecae do have tails. These are the only ones to be discreet among the previously mentioned. Cynocephali are also numbered among the monkeys. They are very common in Ethiopia. They are violent in leaping and fierce in biting. They never get tame enough not to be rather ferocious. Sphinxes are also reckoned as monkeys. They are shaggy, defenseless, and docilely ready to forget their wild freedom. There are others which they call satyrs with quite agreeable figure, but with movements of ceaseless pantomime. The Calitrices differ from the rest in nearly their whole appearance. They have a beard on the face and a copious tail, but it is not difficult to catch them, but rare to find them. Nor do they live in any other parts than Ethiopia, and there in open air.
Adam gave their name to camels with good reason. For when they are being loaded up, they kneel down and make themselves lower or humbler. And the Greek for lower humble is cam. Or else it is because the creature is humped on the back. And the word camera means curved in Greek. Although other regions produce them, yet Arabia does so the most. The Bactrians breed the strongest camels, but Arabia breeds the largest number. The two kinds differ in this, that the Arabians have humps on the back. These Bactrians never wear away their hooves. They have fleshy soles with certain Constantina-like pads, and from these, there is a cushioning counteraction for the walkers, with no hard impediment to putting down the foot. They are kept for two purposes. Some are accommodated to carry a burden. Others are more speedy, but cannot be given loads beyond what is fitting. Nor are the latter willing to do more than the accustomed distances. When they come into season, they are so unbridled by the matter that they run mad for the want of love. They detest horses. They are good at putting up with the weariness of thirst, and indeed, when the chance of drinking is given for whatever lack may come in the future for a long time, they go for dirty waters and avoid clean ones. In fact, unless there should be fouler drink available, they themselves stir up the slime with busy trampling in order that it should be muddied. If they happen to be sold to a stranger, they grow ill, disgusted at the price. Females are provided in warfare, but it is so arranged that their desire for copulation is frustrated, for they are thought to do more valiantly if they are prevented from coercion. The dromedary is a species of camel, but smaller in stature and more swift, and that is the way it gets its name, for racing and speed are called dromos in Greek. It is accustomed to cover a hundred miles in more than a day. This creature, like the sheep and bull and the camel, ruminates. The word rumination is got from the gullet, a ruma, the top part of the neck through which food is brought up against by the animals after being swallowed down. Now, all birds are called birds, but there are a lot of them. For just as they differ from one another in species, so do they in diversity of nature. Some are simple-minded, like the pigeon. Others astute, like the partridge. Some subject themselves to the hand of man, like hawks. Others shun it, like the garamantes. Some are delighted with human society, like the swallow. Others, like the rock dove, prefer a secret way of life in desert places. Some only feed on corn which they find, like the goose, while others eat flesh and turn their minds to thieving, like the kite. Some congregate, that is, fly in flocks, like starlings and the quail. Others are solitary, that is, go singly, pillaging by cunning, like the eagle, the hawk, and others of that sort. Some squeak, like the swallow. Others breathe out the most beautiful songs, like the swan and the blackbird while others again imitate the words and voices of men, like the parrot and the magpie. There are numberless more, differing as to kind and custom, for there are so many sorts of birds that it is not possible to learn every one, nor indeed is there anybody who can penetrate all the deserts of Scythia and India and Ethiopia to know their species according to the differences of them. They are called birds because they do not follow straight roads, but stray through any byway. They are called winged ones because they mount with wings to the high places and reach the heavens with a rowing of plumes. They are called fowls from their ability to fly. You see, we use the verb to wing from wings, just as we say to leg it from legs. And the vola or palm is the middle part of the hand or foot while in birds it is the middle part of the wing, by the motion of whose feathers they are propelled, 
hence volucres. The wings are the things in which the feathers, after being placed in order, allow the exercise of flight. Moreover, they are called wings because the birds nourish and foster their chicks with them by folding them up in these. The feather is given its name from hovering, that is, from flying, whence also comes to suspend. For the birds are kept up by the aid of feathers when they launch themselves on the air. Plumes get their name from hairs, because just as there are hairs on the body of a quadruped, so there are plumes on a bird. It is known that the names of many birds are invented from the sound of their voices. For example, Grus, Corvus, Cygnus, Bubo, Milvus, Ulula, Cucalcus, Garellus, Graculus, etc. The particular kind of song they have suggests what men should call them. An odd thing is that the offspring of all birds are born twice. First when the eggs are laid, then when they are formed and hatched by the heat of the mother's body. Eggs are called ova because they are full of liquid inside. You see, a thing which has liquid on the outside is wet, while a thing which has liquid on the inside is juicy. However, some people think that the name of egg has a Greek origin, and indeed those people do call them oa, with the V left out. Some eggs are created in the wind at a fundament, but then they are not fertile, unless they are conceived with male intercourse. They say that the power of the egg is so great that wood which has been sprinkled with them does not burn hotly, and if a garment is put close to a fire of that sort, it will not scorch. Mixed with chalk, they are used to glue pieces of glass together. The fox gets his name from a person who winds wool, for he is a creature with circuitous pug marks which never runs straight but goes on his way with torturous windings. He is a fraudulent and ingenious animal. When he is hungry and nothing turns up for him to devour, he rolls himself in red mud so that he looks as if he were stained with blood. He then throws himself on the ground and holds his breath so that he does not seem to breathe. The bird, seeing that he is not breathing, and that he looks like he were covered with blood with his tongue hanging out, think that he is dead and come down to sit on him. Well, thus he grabs them and gobbles them up. The devil has the same nature. With all those who are living according to the flesh, he feigns himself to be dead until he gets them in his gullet and punishes them. But for spiritual men of faith, he is truly dead and reduced to nothing. Furthermore, those who wish to follow the devil's work perish. As the apostle says, Know this, since if you live after flesh you shall die, but if you mortify the doings of the foxy body according to the spirit, you shall live. And as the Lord God says, They will go into the lower parts of the earth, they will be given over to the power of the sword, and will become portion for foxes. Believe it. Snakes have three odd things about them. The first odd thing is that when they are getting old, their eyes grow blind, and if they want to renovate themselves, they go away somewhere and fast for a long time until their skins are loose. Then they look for a tight crack in the rocks and go in and lay aside the old skin by scraping it off. Thus, we, through much tribulation and abstinence for the sake of Christ, put off the old man and his garment. In this way we may seek the spiritual rock, Jesus, in the tight crack that is the straight gate. The second odd thing about a snake is that when it goes to a river to drink water, it does not take its poison with it, but spews it into a hole. 
Thus we, when we come to the living water and, drawing upon the eternal, come to hear the heavenly word of the church, we also ought to cast the poison out of ourselves, that is, bad and earthly longings. The third odd thing is that if a snake sees a naked man, it is afraid of him. But if it sees him with his clothes on, it springs upon him. We can understand the spiritual sense of this if we reflect that when the first man, Adam, was naked in paradise, the serpent was not able to spring upon him. But after he was dressed in the morality of the body, the serpent did spring. Just so, if you are wearing the moral garment, that is, the old man, and if you are long-standingly of the evil days, the serpent will pounce on you. But if you rid yourself of the garb worn by the principalities of powers of darkness in this generation, then the serpent will not be able to pounce, that is, the devil. Further facts about reptiles are, by a diet of fennel, snakes can cure themselves of prolonged blindness, and thus when they feel that their eyes are getting overcast, they seek for the well-known remedies, nor are they disappointed in the result. The tortoise, which is nourished through entrails similar to those of a serpent, protects itself by eating majorum when it sees a venomous creature sneaking up on it. If a serpent swallows the spittle of a fasting man, it dies. It is believed, so Pliny says, that if a snake can get away with only two fingers length of the body attached to the head, it will survive. This is why it presents the whole body foremost in front of the head when a person goes to hit it. All snakes suffer from bad eyesight, and they seldom see forward, nor is this fortuitous since their eyes are not in their faces but in their temples, so that they can hear better than they see. No animal flickers its tongue so fast as a snake does, and for this reason they seem to have triple tongues where there is really only one. The bodies of snakes are damp, so that they mark the road by which they go with slime. Their tracks are such that they seem to have no feet, but they do crawl with the pressure of scales on the end of their ribs, which are arranged equally from the top of the throat to the lower belly. The scales are like claws, which rest upon the ribs as if on legs. When any part of the body, from the belly to the head, is struck with a blow, the snake is disabled and unable to get back onto its course, because wherever the blow fell, it broke the spine, by which the rib feet and the whole movement of the body are propelled. Snakes are said to live for a long time, the reason being that, when they have sloughed off their old skins, it is granted to them to cast off their old age and return to youth. The skins are called exuviae, because when they get old, they take them off. Exuant. You see, dresses and clothes are called dresses and clothes because you dress yourself in them and clothe yourself in them. Pythagoras says, Serpents are created out of the spinal marrow of corpses. A thing which Ovid also calls to mind in the book of the Metamorphoses, when he says, some there are who believe that sealed in the grave, the spine rotting, mirror of humankind do turn themselves into serpents. And this, if it is to be credited, is all very appropriate, that just as a man's death was first brought about by a snake, so by the death of a man a snake should be brought about. There is an ocean monster which is called a whale because of the frightfulness of his body and because it was this animal which swallowed Jonah and its belly was so great that people took it to be hell. Jonah himself remarked, he heard me out of the belly of hell. This animal lifts its back out of the open sea above the watery waves and then it anchors itself in one place and on its back, what with the shingle of the ocean drawn there by the gales, a level lawn gets made and bushes begin to grow there. Sailing ships that happen to be going that way take it to be an island and land on it. Then they make themselves a fireplace. But the whale, feeling the hotness of the fire, suddenly plunges down into the depths of the deep and pulls down the anchored ship with it into the profound. 
Now this is just the way in which unbelievers get paid off. I mean the people who are ignorant of the wiles of the devil and place their hopes in him and his works. They anchor themselves to him, and down they go into the fires of hell. The nature of this monster is that whenever it feels hungry, it opens its mouth and blows out a sort of pleasantly smelling breath, and when the smaller fishes notice the odor of this, they crowd together in the mouth. Naturally, when the monster feels his mouth to be full, he shuts it at once. Thus, he swallows them down. That is the way in which human people who are lacking faith get addicted to pleasures. They pander to their grub as if it were perfume. Then, suddenly, the devil gobbles them up. The Baleenae are animals of prodigious size, and they get their name from blowing or spouting waters. They puff the water higher than other beasts of the sea. In Greek, Baleen means to throw out. The mate of a female whale is the musculus, for a lady whale is not permitted to conceive by coition. The crab goes in for a cunning stratagem due to his greed. He is very fond of oysters and likes to get himself a banquet of their flesh. But although eager for dinner, he understands the danger since the pursuit is as difficult as it is hazardous. It is difficult because the inner flesh of an oyster is contained within very strong shells, as if nature, its maker, had by her imperial command fortified the soft part of the body with walls. She feeds and cherishes this flesh in a kind of arched dome in the middle of the shell, disposes it as if it were in a sort of hollow. For this reason, the handling of oysters has to be done carefully, because nothing can open the closed oyster by force, and thus it is dangerous for the crab to insert its claw. Betaking himself to artfulness, therefore, the crab lays an ambush with a new plot of his own. Because all species delight in relaxing themselves, the crab investigates to find out whether at any time the oyster opens that double shell of his in places remote from all wind and safe from rays of the sun, or whether it unlocks the fastenings of its gate so that it may pleasure its internal organs in the free air. Then the crab, secretly casting in a pebble, prevents the closing of the oyster and thus, finding the lock forced, inserts his claws safely and feeds on the internal flesh. Now is not that just like men, those corrupt creatures who follow the habit of the crab creep into the practice of unnatural trickery and eke out the weakness of their powers by a sort of cunning. They join deceit to cruelty and are fed upon the distress of others. Do you, therefore, be content with your own things and do not seek the injury of your neighbors to support you. The simple fare of a man who does no harm is the right food. Having his own property, he knows not how to plot against his fellow man's, not does he burn with the flames of avarice. Covetousness is to him only a loss of virtue and an incentive to greed. And so, blessed is that poverty which truthfully sticks to its own goods, and meet it is to be preferred above all riches. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great trouble and treasure therewith. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. Let us then devote ourselves to acquiring merit and to maintaining what is wholesome, not to the cheating of another's innocence. Let it be left to us to make use of the marine example in perfecting our own well-being, not in the undoing of our neighbor. Crabs are so called because they are shellfish with legs. These animals are hostile to oysters, for they live on the flesh of those by a wonderful stratagem. Because they cannot open the shell, they puzzle out how to pick the lock. They privily insert a stone, and the closing of the oyster being prevented, eat away its flesh. Some people relate that if ten crabs are compounded with a handful of basil, all scorpions in the neighborhood will be gathered to that place. There are two kinds of crab, river ones and sea ones.
There is an animal called an ostrich, which the Greeks call Struthio camelus. Actually, the Latins call it Struthio too. This bird has really got wings, but it does not fly. Furthermore, it has feet like a camel. Now, when the time comes for it to lay some eggs, the ostrich raises its eyes to the heavens and looks to see whether those stars which are called the Pleiades are visible, nor will it lay until the Pleiades appear. When, however, it perceives that constellation round about the month of June, it digs a hole in the earth, and there it deposits the eggs and covers them with sand. Then, when it gets up, instantly forgets about them and never comes back anymore. A certain clemency and mildness of the atmosphere is noticeable in June, and so the sand, being worn by the hot weather, incubates the eggs and hatches out the young. Now, if the ostrich knows its time and seasons, and, disregarding earthly things, cleaves to the heavenly ones, even unto the forgetting of its own offspring, how much more should you, O oh man, strive after the reward of starry callings on account of which God was made man, that he might enlighten you from the powers of darkness and place you with the chiefs of his people in the glorious kingdom of the heavens? The bear is connected with the word Orsus. It is said she gets her name because she sculptures her brood with her mouth, Ore. For they say that these creatures produce a formless fetus, and this the mother bear arranges into proper legs and arms by licking it. This is because of the prematurity of the birth. In short, she pups on the thirtieth day, from whence it comes that a hasty, unformed creation is brought forth. A bear's head is feeble. The greatest strength is in the arms and loins, for which reason they sometimes stand upright. Nor do they neglect the healer's art. Indeed, if they are afflicted with a serious injury and damaged by wounds, they know how to doctor themselves by stroking their sores with an herb, whose name is Flormus, as the Greeks call it, so that they are cured by the mere touch. A sick bear eats ants. Numidian bears excel others so far as the thickness of their shaggy hair is concerned, but the creature itself is the same wherever they breed. They do not make love like other quadrupeds, but being joined in mutual embraces, they copulate in the human way. The winter season provokes the inclination to lust. The males respect the pregnant females with the decency of a private room, and through the same layers for their lying in, they are divided by earthworks into separate beds. The period of gestation is short, since the thirtieth day relieves the womb. This is why the precipitate childbirth creates shapeless fruits. They bring forth very tiny pulps with a white color, with no eyes. They gradually sculpture these by licking, and meanwhile, they cherish them to their bosoms as so to draw up the animal's spirit, being warmed by this careful incubation. During this time, with absolutely no food for the first 14 days, the sleepless she-bears get so deeply drowsy that they cannot be woken up even by wounds, and they lie hid after bearing for three months. Then, after coming out into the free daylight, they suffer so much from being unaccustomed to the light that you would take them to be struck blind. Bears look out for the hives of bees and long for the honeycombs very much. When they have eaten the fruits of the mandrake, they die, unless they hurry off for fear that the poison should grow strong enough to destroy them and eat ants to recuperate their health. If ever they attack bulls, they know what parts to bring them down more readily, nor will they go for anything but the horns or the nostrils. The nostrils, because the sharper pain comes in the tenderer places. <laughs> 